Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the On Becoming Legend podcast. I'm your host, Rory Miller, and here we talk about all things legacy. We do this primarily by looking back at the turning points in our lives, learning the lessons, and living them forward. And this week, I could not be more excited to bring you an interview with John Michael Morgan. Who is John Michael Morgan? John Michael Morgan is the author of the best-selling book, Brand Against the Machine, which spent nine months on the Amazon's list of top-rated marketing books. He's an in-demand speaker on topics like leadership, achievement, marketing, and has been on stages across the world. He's also the founder of Achiever, where for more than a decade, he's been coaching entrepreneurs and leaders on things like personal development, leadership, marketing, branding, and he's worked with some of the world's most successful brands like BMW, McDonald's, Starbucks, Disney, Twitter, and Google, just to name drop a few. John began studying the topics of personal development and achievement when he was younger as a way to deal with his own depression. And since then, has started multiple successful businesses and is now on a mission to equip 10 million leaders with strategies they need to achieve success. He lives in Nashville, Tennessee, is married and has two kids. John, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, man. It's great to be here. It is great to have you. So I want to talk a lot about your story and obviously the inflection points. And I really want to try to pull out the lessons that, that you've learned the hard way and share those with the audience so that they can avoid some of those same mistakes some of those same things in their own life. But the first thing I want to talk about, I'd like to hear you say, um, what is killing Kenobi? <laughs> what? Where in the world did you find that? Um, <laughs> well, I have my ways, John. I have, wow. I have my ways. Uh, okay. So you're going way back. Yeah, to the beginning. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> killing Kenobi was the name of a punk rock band that I was in. <laughs> for many years uh, when that was what I was gonna grow up and you know, do for a career. Uh, and not many people know that, so that is very impressive <laughs> that, that you were uh, able to dig that up. So I'm really glad you brought that up. So that was, you know, for all intents and purposes, would you say that that was your first co like career path? Uh, yeah, so that was, I mean, we're going back like, you know, probably 13, 14 years old. Um, you know, I grew up in, you know, the, by the time you start getting old enough to like actually decide what music you like and not just listen to whatever your parents <laughs> yeah, exactly. have playing, um, it was at the same time that the grunge era came out. So Nirvana and Pearl Jam and Soundgarden and all of that. So obviously I was uh, heavily immersed in uh, that kind of music. And I remember getting a guitar for Christmas. And so like, there was just no question that's what I was going to do. Um, while I was doing that, I still had entrepreneurial tendencies um we had magazine sales in high school where if you were like top in the school or top in the state you won computers and entire weeks off school and i was motivated by that not realizing that that was actually sales or even being an entrepreneur uh so that wasn't i was doing it but it wasn't for a career path the music thing was that's what i'll do uh the only thing that made sense to me and so i was going to grow up and smash guitars and scream into microphones and you know that was it <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic so specifically on that i mean i guess i should back up a step so when you know around that time who were the major influences in your life and in, in terms of the people that you were really looking for approval from like uh, for me it was always my nuclear family like my parents my my family were the people that i wanted for some people it's a coach some people it's you know a pastor or clergy like who were the people that were sort of guiding you at that point in your life Man, so this is a great question because the problem was I didn't have those people mm. at that point in my life. And I felt very, very lost. And so my heroes or, you know, kind of role models or, you know, what I was chasing uh, were not always the great ones, right? You know, I was struggling with depression. So Kurt Cobain was like my idol. Yeah. And, you know, looking back, I'm like, well, that was obviously a bad choice you know, for, for someone, you know, struggling through these same kind of, you know, issues that he had. And so it was, um, you know, but it was because I didn't have that. I didn't know who to make proud or, you know, my parents were great parents, but there wasn't, um, you know, this heavy expectation of this is what we expect of you. This is what we want of you. You know, my brother was a very, very talented person. And, uh, you know, a lot of the attention would sort of go to him in terms of what possible career paths he had. For me, it was just, hey, do whatever you want to do. Just don't screw up which was great. And like, I needed that, but it wasn't like I had, um, Oh, here's this entrepreneur or here's this, you know, leader and oh man, that like, I, I want, if they can approve of what I'm doing, you know, that'll make me happy. And instead it was a search of 
how will I approve myself? Like, how do I uh, love myself? How do I find, you know, some kind of uh, sense of pride and self-worth? Uh, those are the years of my life that I was desperately seeking that. So how did you, how did you sort of stumble onto the entrepreneurship thing then? So I, I would have, that's surprising. You said you don't really have an influence for that. Cause I would have expected that you were kind of either following in somebody's footsteps or, or following a role model, but it sounds like the role model would have been the musicians. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, I have to say, I have to give a lot of credit to um, now she's my wife. We met in high school and she and I met in the thick of my depression and music and all of that. And she supported whatever I wanted to do, but certainly, you know, there was a sense of like, well, I don't want to screw that up. You know, you know, so I got to make sure, you know, that she's taking care of that she's happy. But yeah. what, what got me into then, you know, say marketing or those things was actually um, being a naive kid that didn't know better. So I remember um, I switched schools in the middle of high school. And when I went to the new school, they said, you know, you get to pick some of your classes. Like you have to have math and English and science, but you get to pick some. And reading through the description of classes, the way I read marketing I thought that was psychology. And so I was like, oh, if I take that class, I'll figure out what's wrong with me. Like I'll figure out, you know, the head stuff. Yeah. So I signed up, you know, for this marketing class, oblivious, right? And so in that class, um, I'm learning marketing, I'm learning sales, I'm learning persuasion and branding and, you know, these different things. And all of it, I'm thinking, again, is psychology. Like, we buy this stuff. This is how we think. So right. how do we think about other, you know, like all, all that. And so I started then uh, reading books about uh, whether it was marketing or even, you know, books like Think and Grow Rich. And they think not because, oh, I wanted to be rich. It was, I want to save my life. I, I want to make sure that I don't have the depression thoughts anymore and, you know, figure this out. So uh, it was really accidental that, uh, you know, very much really a God thing that I started getting into uh, marketing and learning all of that because certainly none of my friends were right. It wasn't the cool thing to be like, Oh, just read this marketing book. You guys should right. check it out. <laughs> you know, wasn't going to make me popular. Uh, but it was really just the fact that I was kind of too stupid to know better to like, see that marketing is one thing and psychology is another. Obviously there's some things that overlap, but when you're a teenager, you don't see that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I'd like to talk a little bit about college. And, and one of the main reasons I want to discuss this is because I know that in the, in the global sense and really in almost every culture, there's kind of this sense of like, you have to go to college to have a better life. Like right. every adult, every parent wants their kids to go to college, get a degree for that. So you can have it better than I had it. But at the same time, so many people are freaking unhappy. Like people go to college because they feel like they have to. So, you know, being what I would say is a little more self-directed than most people at your age, how did you navigate that choice you know did you go to college what did that experience look like <laughs> so this is a this is a great question um th there is definitely a story behind it so freedom is my biggest motivator like by far like almost to the point that like it would cause me harm right, right? like there have been times in my life where i thought oh i hope i don't subconsciously want to be homeless so that I'd have the freedom of, you know, whatever, whatever yeah, I want to do. Nobody right? telling me what to do. <laughs> right, right, right. The ultimate freedom is you live anywhere. Exactly. Right. So what had happened is um, I had uh, during high school, so I liked the music, right? Well, I would drive to these different local, you know, independent record shops around Nashville. And there was these CDs that, you know, were called bootlegs. It was like, a Nirvana concert or, you know, Alice in Chains concert or whatever. And it'd be like, you know, 10, $12. Again, as like a diehard fan of that music, I'd buy all of them. I'd be every Saturday, see what new they had, and I'd buy them. Around this time, a brand new site came out that became a big deal called eBay. And I went on eBay and realized, holy crap, that CD that I just paid $10 for, this dude in Kansas will pay 50 for it. Mm. So I start selling stuff on eBay. And then uh, we would go to Disney World a lot. And Disney used to sell these big snow globes that like were huge, like somewhere $7,500. And because we went all the time, I would make my mom and dad buy me a bunch of them. So then I would come home and I'd start selling them on eBay. So all of a sudden I'm making money and I'm a kid, like, what do I care? So right. I would just hand my mom the money and say, here, I made this, like, go put it away. And I didn't realize it at the time, but thankfully, because my parents were very smart financially, they were actually investing it. And that money was making me money, but I had no idea. So I was being an entrepreneur at that point without 
goals or ambitions. So mm -hmm. what happened is exactly what you said, which is the expectation of, John, when you're done with high school, it's time to go to college. Yeah. Well, I was actually able to graduate high school a year early, but my parents wanted me to do the ceremony and walk the line uh, the year I was supposed to, like with the friends and everything that I grew up with. Right. So I had an entire year, my senior year, where I'm just staying at home doing nothing. I got really used to that. So now, you know, I actually graduate and it's time to go to college. This is a bit of an adjustment for me. So I go for like a week and I'll never forget this. I, I go, I take a history class because I love history and I thought that will be a great class. So we go in, I'm nervous. I don't know anybody in there. There's people, you know, all kinds of ages and that yeah. was like weird to me. And the teacher, the professor, I guess, was like really, really angry at, I guess, life I'm not even sure yeah. but he was not a pleasant man and he says immediately he writes some Latin phrase on the board and he's like does anyone know what this says and then he's furious that none of us know so already I'm like college sucks like this is you know intense and what the phrase basically meant was like it's over or something and then he goes into this thing he's like listen I'm not your babysitter I I'm not here to hold your hand like I don't care if you're in class. I don't care if you do the work. You can walk out right now, and I don't care. This isn't high school. And I'm like, are you serious? I can walk out right now, and this dude doesn't care because there's a Taco Bell across the street, <laughs> and, like, I'm all about this. So, Rory, I'm embarrassed to tell you I stopped going. But, here, but here's the thing. Not only did I stop going, I didn't tell anybody that I stopped going. So I still woke up every single day with my backpack and my books, drove to the college, slept in my car till class was over, and then would drive home. And I did this for like two and a half years until uh, my family was like, you know, how's it going? Like, were you close to graduating? And I realized like, oh, I better tell people that I'm not close to graduating <laughs> <laughs> at all. But what I realized was I couldn't stand sitting in the classroom looking out the window and like seeing cars drive by and like seeing life happen. Yeah. And I thought, man, like with what I did in high school with magazine sales, with what I did with eBay, like it wasn't that I realized I was being an entrepreneur. There was just this thought of, I, I can go do my own thing. Right. And I always, for some reason, I always hated the idea of someone saying to me, this is your job. This is how much you're going to make. This is the ceiling on it for the rest of your life. Yeah. And I'll go. That sounded so miserable to me. But I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I just know I'm not going to sit here for four years to get a degree to then get a job I hate. So you faked it for two and a half years. And I have to know, how did that conversation go when you had it? And, and who had the worst response? Okay. Um, I think my wife, Brooke, had the worst response because... Were you married at the time? No, but we were engaged. Okay, so you know, like she's we already were, committed. Right. She was locked in at this point, but there was, you know, a couple of loopholes she could have taken, you know, for her own freedom. Uh, and she wasn't mad. I think it was just more concerned of, do you have a plan? Like, you know, do you, right. like, you know, what are you, like, that's fine, but like, what are you going to do kind of a thing? Um, I thought my mom and dad would be furious. In fact, I thought there's no way they're even going to let me quit. Right. And so what ended up happening is thankfully my brother who was older than me uh, was graduating and it had taken him like six years and he went to some real fancy expensive college. So my parents were kind of burnt out and jaded on, you know, on the whole idea yeah. of it. And so uh, when I came to them and told them that I was just, I never actually said, I'm going to quit college or by the way, I've not been going. My thing to them was I decided I was going to go into real estate. And my parents are in the construction industry. Okay. So real estate is something they understand. Right. And I don't think it occurred to them that like I was quitting college to go to real estate school. I think in their mind, they looked at it as I finally chose my career path, you, you, yeah. you know, kind of a thing. And the only reason I chose real estate, by the way, is that uh, my wife had said, you've read all these books about sales and marketing. Why don't you do something like that? And um, I wanted to do something. My grandfather is a, a electrical inspector. So he would drive around all day with a clipboard and his truck and just, you know, do whatever he wanted, right? Like eat whenever he wanted, listen to whatever he wanted, right? And I thought, right. I need to find that kind of job. So I was going to be a home inspector, 
when I found out you had to get on the roof, obviously to inspect the house and I'm afraid of heights. So I was like, screw that. And so she was like, yeah, why don't you just sell them? So I was like, all right, sure, I'll do that. <laughs> That's that was so it. Funny. So I, I think I'm starting to notice a trend where a lot of these decisions were kind of accidents. So you're just like, well, I, I want to do home inspection, but I'm scared of heights, so I'll just go do real estate instead. Yeah, I, I very much, um, it changes. And I found my calling, I find my passion. But certainly in those early years, what got me by was a very uh, like strong self-awareness of what I didn't want. Yeah. And I let that guide me, even though I didn't exactly know what I wanted. I just knew very clearly, like, well, I don't want this. So I'm going to keep trying stuff till I figure out maybe then what I do want. Yeah, I think that's really powerful because so many people, like we talked about with college, are they're not only not tuning into what they want, they're actually pursuing life based on what other people want for them. And I think right. it's a pretty easy jump to just go to what do you want? Because the, the question of like, what do I want out of life? That's, that's kind of a tough question to answer. And what I liked at 20, I don't like at 30. And so these things change. But I think, yeah, I think that's actually really insightful. If people just started with what are the things you don't want in the life that you dream of? I think that would help push people in the right direction nine times out of 10. Absolutely. You know, I, I'm really fortunate because I remember in school, even in middle school, the guidance counselors would pressure you to pick a career path and you know what you were going to do. And I would come home from school in tears because I'm like, I'm supposed to know what I want to do. And I have right. no idea. And I'm really fortunate because my mom would always say, you don't have to know. You have plenty of time to figure it out. Do not listen to them. You know, and I'm very glad because that did keep me like going of, okay, when I'm, you know, 18, I don't need to know when I'm 20, I don't need to know. Like when I'm 22, right. I don't necessarily need to know, like, you know, you can always adapt and evolve or evolve and improve. And so uh, I'm, I'm very lucky. So my mom was always one to just say, you know, you'll figure it out. Like, you know, you'll get it eventually. Don't worry about it. And don't put right. a time limit on it. Now with them being there, you said they were in the construction industry and they own their own business or? Correct. Okay. So with that being said, was there, I guess that's probably kind of the opposite for most people, but what, did you ever feel any pressure or, um, you know, I, yeah, I guess pressure is probably the best word, but to go into your own thing or to start your own thing, or, you know, do you think that had a big influence on you going the entrepreneurship route? Yeah. So it's really interesting because my parents, if you were interviewing them, the word entrepreneur would never come out of their mouths. They don't think of themselves like that. They're just hardworking people who just happen to own what they do. Got kind right. of a thing. Um, so it's not like they're entrepreneurial in that they're going to try to do multiple businesses or, you know, anything like, my dad knew what he was doing. He wanted to own the business. And that's what they've been doing now, like I think 38 years or something, right? Like, or yeah. longer than that, I think it's 45. Uh, so anyways, you know, that's been their focus. Growing up, we then didn't hear that language of entrepreneurship or, or anything like that. But without realizing it, I did see the benefits and the advantages of being an entrepreneur because we could take vacation pretty much whenever we wanted. You know, my mom was available to take my brother and I to practices and games and what, you know what I mean? Like I could see kind of the, you know, the fruits of their labor in terms right. of, oh, like there's no one telling them what to do. I never saw my dad, you know, stressed about, you know, getting laid off or anything. Right. So it was yeah. like, oh, okay. You know, there's that element of it. Um, the interesting thing about them though, is because my dad worked so hard to build what he has built and still works hard. His whole thing to my brother and I was. I'm doing this so you guys can go do something else. Like, you know, he didn't want us to come be a part of his company. There was no expectation of right. you're going to take it over one day or you need to, you know, start at the bottom and work your way up. Instead, it was, I've done this to give you the ability to go do something. Like, you know, he wanted it to obviously be successful, but go do it. So, uh, you know, there wasn't like, John, you should be an entrepreneur. You should start your own business. Uh, but it was this thing of, both parents knew everyone in my family knew John talks a lot. John likes to talk. Uh, he can be persuasive. The running joke was always that I was going to be either a preacher, a politician or a comedian. And that was like the thing. It was like, that was the career path. From the time I was like five, uh, you know, all the way, like pretty much rest of my life. So when I got into real estate, everyone was kind of like, Oh, okay. That makes sense. Like John's going to go talk to people. Yeah. That we get that. That's awesome. 
So yeah, so now you're in real estate and I would like to hear you tell the story of the time where you told your wife that she wouldn't have to worry about income anymore. That you were turning <laughs> a corner in your business. Yeah, so it's, it's really interesting. So when we got married, I'm you know in real estate and she's got a job and that job was what kept us alive mm. because I was not lighting the world on fire. My first year in real estate, I sold two homes one of them was the one we bought. Uh, so it really doesn't even count, but I try to count it because two sounds a lot better than one. Uh, you know, it was, it was a bad time because when you get into real estate, everyone says, uh, go to your network. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm a kid. What do you mean go to my network? And my friends are, you know, working at fast food restaurants and right. you know, like, what do you, none of them are, have their life together about you know, buying a house. So I didn't understand um, you know, sort of how to grow that business at first. And it was her paycheck that helped us. And then um, the place she worked for, they were cutting back. And so they were like, well, who's been here, you know, the longest, you're safe. Who's not been here as long, you're not safe. And so she was one of those people. So I remember it was a Valentine's Day. She calls me and she's crying. She's like, listen, like, they're going to cut me off. And I don't know how we're going to do it. And I'm like, babe, we're going to be fine. And she's like, what do you mean? Like, what, what, do you, what are we going to do? And I'm like, you're going to come work for me. And I could hear her laughing. <laughs> uh, because I had no clients, no prospects, you know, like nothing. Like I was in real estate, but I was basically watching Oprah and Dr. Phil all afternoon. Like there wasn't a lot of activity going on you know, in this business. And so she was like, I don't understand like how that's going to work. And I said, please just trust me. You're going to come work for me. And I don't know what it was other than I have this, um, I, I don't know if it's a stubbornness or what, like I lack the ability to quit. And that's not always a good thing because sometimes I can stick with stuff way too long, right. but I lack the ability to quit. So in that moment, I didn't feel defeated. I felt like, let me show the world what I can do. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, going from no prospects, no clients, nothing to about 30 days later, closing five houses and making enough money that we were fine for the rest of that year, you know, based on how we'd been living and our budget right. and everything. And I told her, I was like, listen, if I can do that, we're never going to have to worry again. Like I have figured out how to write ads. I have figured out, you know, what to say to people. I have figured I've unlocked, you, you know, the thing where right. now I, I can do this. Um, of course, because I had made that money, I then proceeded to do nothing for like the next six months. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Just rest on your laurels. Exactly. Because I was like, well, obviously I'm the king of sales. There's no, uh, you know, don't need to be a hero. I'll just, you know, take it easy for a while. But then all of a sudden we looked at the bank account and we're like, oh, I think I need to actually go back and do something again, start selling again. <laughs> uh, but that was that, it was, it was a really pivotal moment in my career and in my life for myself was realizing, again, like going back to freedom, I have the ability to create whatever I want. It doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter what other people say. The truth is there is money out there. There are customers out there. And maybe I've got to talk to 2000 of them, you know, to get the money that I want, but okay, then I'll just go do that. Like it's a numbers game. Right. And that realization for me was when I told her, I was like, it, it's fine. And so years later, I remember telling her, you know, she was like, what if uh, the internet goes away? What if just something happens and like internet's outlawed? I'm like, I will be the top hammer salesman at home Depot. Like it doesn't matter. Like now that I know how to sell, yeah, we're not going to be in trouble ever again. And it was also that was pivotal emotionally for me, because it was one of the first times that turning the corner from depression of like, self worth and self love of like realizing that validation that you were you know mentioning early on was that, you know what, I'm gonna be okay. Like, I'm realizing now that I have a skill set in figuring things out. <laughs> and because of that, a lot can be thrown at me and a lot has, but I'm going to be able to make it. And it's really fascinating you say that because as you were talking about that, I'm realizing that I think a lot of entrepreneurs, um, I think there's a tendency, not so much in your case, but in a lot of people's cases that the, they want to go be the entrepreneur, do their own thing, create, build something new. And a lot of the influences in their life want them to walk some proven path. They be the lawyer, be the doctor, be the other thing. And I think that, like you said, it's there, there is a form of validation that comes for entrepreneurs from the market. Mm -hmm. when you do put something out there and it, it starts to sell. And so that's interesting. I, I wonder, I have to think about that more and how that applies in my own life. But I think there's definitely a sort of external validation that comes from selling yourself and being able to have that well-received 
But I love that you talked about the value of learning how to sell and how that, how much that served you long-term, because that's one thing that I think anybody can apply is really trying to develop skills that have value to somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, and obviously degrees are one way to do that, but it's not the only way. I mean, negotiating is a skill that is good in any sure. persuasion. I, I, absolutely, like man. And, and I want to tell you, cause you, you're asking me such great questions that nobody's ever asked me. Uh, I, I want to talk about something, if you don't mind that yeah, I, I don't think I've ever shared in, in any kind of setting like this before. And that is because and we can, I can share this now because the questions you've asked allow the connections to be there for the listeners, which is going back to a punk rock band, <laughs> right? As silly as it sounds, I know this is gonna be crazy, but I never lost those punk rock roots. Yeah. And so when I got into sales, it was always like, I'm learning the tactics, I'm learning the principles, I'm learning little techniques and all that's great. But the only time I had success was when I found my version of that. When I figured out like, how do I do it my way? And my way is always going to be not necessarily edgy, but a, a little bit rock and roll. And I'll mm -hmm. share a story of this. So uh, in real estate, obviously, uh, for sale by owners are uh, both loved and hated by agents, right. right? Like the good news is this person is announcing to the world that they want to sell their house. That's a lead. The bad news is they're also announcing to the world that they hate real estate agents and they don't want to talk to them. So uh, it, it, like all good marketers, my for sale by owner marketing campaign was super aggressive. We would mail them a piece of direct mail every five days for 45 days. Wow. And the idea being when they're ready to make a decision, they're going to use the agent that's in front of them at that moment. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to keep and go. So I get a call one time by a guy and he's like, listen, I've tried to sell my house and I've talked to other agents, you know, I want you to come out. Let's see what you got. And I was like, yes, sir. You know, sounds great. Well, when I looked up his home, like I got super excited and nervous because the average sales price in my market at that time was like $150,000. His home was like a $900,000 listing oh, wow. on a golf course. You know? Yeah. Like super nice. And I was like, Oh my God, this is the biggest listing I'll ever have. This could be the biggest sale I've ever had. I'm immediately calculating commission and what I'm going to buy. And like, I've not even had the appointment with the guy. Yeah. So I show up and, and I remember, uh, just again, just being real nervous about it, but just thinking, you know, it's no big deal. Like whatever happens, happens. I knock on this guy's door. Like I ring the bell, he opens the door and you know, like all salesmen, I'm smiling, eye contact, stick my hand out there, shake his hand. He puts his hand up, like stop. And he goes, wait. And he goes, before you come in my house, I need to let you know something. I hate realtors. And Roy, like going back to that punk rock thing, like without <laughs> hesitation, I said, that's fine. I hate for sale by owners. And he starts laughing and he goes, we're going to get along just great. <laughs> so I walk into his house and I don't act impressed at all. And I say, so tell me, sir, why should I even take this listing on? And he goes, what? And I said, why should I list your house? And he goes, I thought you were here because you wanted to list it. I'm like, you told me you've talked to eight agents and you've tried to sell it yourself. Something's wrong with it. Why do I like, right? Like, I don't want to be the idiot that comes in, you know, and like all of a sudden he and his wife are talking to me. And like 10 minutes later, I realized I had them because they're saying things like, Mr. Morgan, if you choose to take us on, will you do this? And I'm like, this is amazing. Like I sold them right. kind of, you know, reverse psychology or whatever you want to call it, but it was doing it my way. Yeah. Right. Because I feel like most agents would have stood on that porch and said, well, I'm going to show you why realtors aren't so bad. And it's like, no, realtors are bad. We were all bad, right. <laughs> but so sometimes the client. So let me, you know, like just, it was that thing of, I'm just going to do it my way and, and figure it out. So again, like I am going to follow principles, of course, but I'm always going to have my spin on it because I think that goes back to that freedom thing of I'm never, I've never been successful when, I've tried to do it the way other people say it has to be done. Like I may follow what they say 80%, but I've got to have that 20% that's just coming from me. That's so fascinating you say that. And I was thinking about this before our call. I, I, I'm sure this person exists. I have not met a person yet that has walked down the path that somebody else laid before them and ended up happy. Right, right. I just have not met that person. Every single person I've talked to has at some point in the go to high school, then college, then get a job, then get in some point in that plan has realized 
I didn't, I don't want to be here anymore. And then they've kind of had to come to the, the realization of like, oh, I need to do it my way if I'm going to be happy. And, and maybe that looks close. And for some people like you, maybe it's just a, a sharp divergence off the path. But yeah, I think that's really important for people to realize that, that the doing it your way is the key. Yeah, it, it's just something that I've just, like I said, I mean, I, I don't know if it's, it's related to happiness and like personal fulfillment right. or, or what it may be, but I've just, I can look back and every time that I have been hitting roadblock after roadblock or things weren't happening the way I wanted or as fast as I wanted almost every single time it's because I was putting myself in a box that just wasn't me. And, and, you know, even now, you know, I'm real cautious of, you know, you take one area of my business, like say public speaking, Mm -hmm. I want to know the principles of public speaking, but I don't want 88 different tactics because I want to go up there and be completely different than any other speaker that's on that stage. Like my strategy is always, I'll just do it differently. You know, that they, we hear it in business all the time where they're like, look at what everyone else is doing and do the opposite. Right. That was one of the first pieces of business advice I ever got. And I've absolutely been like, that's the sword I'll die on. <laughs> like, okay, I, I, will, I will do that. Um, and again, sometimes, you know what, sometimes it's bad because I remember uh, when everybody was like, oh, you gotta be using Facebook. And I'm like, well, then I won't. It's like. Well, that was probably a bad move. I needed to use Facebook, right? Like, yeah. you know, sometimes it makes me late to the game a bit. But right. again, it's still, well, I'm going to do it my way and I'm going to figure out, you know, what works. So again, I always want to follow the principles, but I think so often entrepreneurs get misguided because they're trying to copy tactics. And it's like, right. no, follow the principles, but let the tactics be your own thing, you know, that works for you and your personality and your style. Yeah, that's so true. And I, I think it's, I mean, it's a type of insecurity, right? Because we, we, we want to be entrepreneurs, but at the same time, we, we, there's that fear that, well, what if I step out and do it my way and I get rejected or I fail or, or what have you? And, and the reality is, you know, you might, but you're, you're going to find success much faster that way than just trying to follow the crowd and, and do other things. So I think that's, I, I think, yeah, I think you know that it's probably at the, at the root of what's been, you know, instrumental to your success and everything that you've done. Um, and I love, I love that story about uh, the $900,000 home. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So you're obviously not in real estate now. Right. So at some point, you changed paths again. And I would love to hear kind of the build up to that decision. You know, at what point you started realizing that maybe you weren't on the right path and how you thought through changing that path. And, and specifically, because it's something you've also talked about, there's the sunk cost fallacy that I think so many people fall victim to is that, well, I've been on this path for so long, I might as well just see it out. Or I've been at this job mm-hmm. for 10 years, I might as well just stay here and do the right thing and, and continue on this path. And it keeps people stuck, right? So how did you, you know, having that sort of pressure, how did you come up to that decision to say, nope, now I'm going to go another way and, and do something else? Right. Great, great question. Um, so, so this is, there was an interesting process here because it wasn't, um, Oh, the, 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 what I did in real estate and what I'm doing now overlapped. And a lot of people don't realize that. It's like they think that I sold the real estate business, took a year off, and then all of a sudden I'm doing this. And that, that's not how it went. So what happened is, uh, I, going back, so in the beginning I was struggling in real estate when, when my wife, and that's the theme here of like her obviously being the smart one of the two of us, <laughs> said, you know all those sales books and stuff that you read? <laughs> like, try what about that? Like, what do they say? And I'm like, oh, Okay, great. And and again, like going back to what we've talked about, about being young, when I started in real estate, I was too young to know that I shouldn't have done this or that I needed permission or whatever. And that was, um, I figured out who was the number one agent in the state of Tennessee. I called him and said, hi, sir, I want to be you. Uh, How do I do that? And to his credit, because I did learn this powerful lesson, successful people are happy to share their ways. And he said, come to my office. And he spent two hours with me. Tell me like, this is what it is. So then I start building the business. I start implementing the marketing part. I'm getting so many leads. I started have, hiring a team of agents underneath me, training them on what to say and how to close them. And I'm handing them off. And now all of a sudden it's like, oh, I realized I don't like working with the people as much as I like doing the marketing. Mm-hmm. I liked writing the ads. I liked, you know, that part of it. I got excited about getting the lead. I didn't get excited about, now I got to go call that lead, you right. know, and sell them a house. It was, you know, for me, it was simply like, oh, I wrote this ad and 53 people responded. That was the rush for me. So in that, as I'm realizing that something happened, which was 
Um, I spent a lot of money on a full page newspaper ad, which, you know, back when newspapers were a thing, right? But it yeah. was full page. Last year. And, right, yeah. and it said uh, what a standing ovation looks like on paper. And it had a hundred testimonials from my clients. And I thought like, I'm about to be a millionaire. This is the greatest ad of all time. Like mic drop, this is amazing. And no one called me to buy or sell a home. So in that sense, the ad completely failed. But what happened is three businesses, not real estate related, called me and said, dang, man, that was a great ad. Uh, can you do one for us? And I'm like, write your ad? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, sure. And they were like, just tell us what it cost. Like, oh, you're paying me to write the ad? Like <laughs> even better. Like I was just going to do it. Like that just sounded like fun. So I started doing that and I was like, well, that was kind of neat, but I'm dumb. And I wasn't thinking, oh, that's a business. I was just mm -hmm. like, how fun and cool was that? You know, it was just like a right. stroke of ego. But then what happened is as my real estate business grew, I guess you could say my brand or the platform. And now I had people from all around contacting me saying, can you teach me this or, you know, my business is struggling or whatever. And I met a guy um, in Nashville who would do like a monthly meetup with business owners. Hmm. And he and I hit it off and he was like, listen, he's like, I'm trying to fill, you know, two hours on these meetings and I don't have enough content for that. He was like, can you do like the last 30 minutes? And I'm like, what do I talk about? And he was like, just marketing, whatever. And I'm like, sure, man, I can do it. And what happened was the audience was responding to me more than him. And it was super rewarding to me where I realized like, I would talk to these people all day, every day. Like, yeah. This is so fun. And I started coaching people and you know, it was like, oh, I'm not getting paid near as much for this as I was real estate, but man, that is so much fun. Yeah. So I started to outsource more and more of the real estate so that I could free up my time to be on the phone with these other entrepreneurs and you know, talking to them. And as that just kept building up, the real estate industry was becoming more and more difficult. We were headed towards, you know, the big crash in the market and everything. Yeah. But I wasn't aware of that. I just knew it was getting harder and harder. And all I could think is these headaches aren't worth it. I like the headaches over here better. Like coaching mm -hmm. people has headaches, but I like those headaches. Real estate, I don't like. Like, I don't like the headaches of that. Mm -hmm. And so I started to realize that I saw the path for real estate. I knew how to be number one. I knew how to be top 25 in the nation. I knew what it would look like and growing the team and, and all of that. And once I saw how clearly to do that, I completely lost interest. And I was like, yeah, this is no longer exciting to me. I know what the next 10 years look like. Right. And I know what headaches are going to be over the next 10 years. And that just doesn't sound like fun. So uh, it was very much um, just kind of a, a God thing. So I had a, a real estate transaction where the people that I was working with were my parents' best friends, practically an aunt and uncle to me. And the transaction went so bad. The other agents trying to blackmail us. Oh, no. My people are all of a sudden stuck, like just with everything they own in a U-Haul and no place to go. And it was this whole thing. And I was like, it shouldn't be this hard. Like, this mm -hmm. is ridiculous. Like, these people want to sell a home. These people want to buy a home. Like, oh my God. And at that moment, I was like, I'm just done. I'm done. And uh, my wife, Brooke, was like, well, what if you did the coaching thing full time? Right. And I was like, yeah, that sounds good. So I called a competitor of mine. I said, today's your lucky day. I'm out. If you want to buy it, it's yours. He was like, holy crap, let's have lunch. Like we did that done. And then all of a sudden now I'm going to do marketing and branding and help uh, huge, you know, big brands and solo entrepreneurs and all of that. And I've never looked back. Like not only was it financially successful, but I realized like, this is what I was made to do. Like, I'm not good at anything else. I'm good at this. <laughs> and it was, so that was the thing of like, okay, cool. And I love the freedom of it because in real estate, even with the marketing, there's regulations, like your name has to be a certain font size and you've got to have these disclaimers and right. just all this stuff. And I'm like, ah, I just wanted to be able to help people and like put out content and say, here's some tips. And then them say, Hey, I like that. I want more. I'll pay you for more information and me say, yes, that sounds great. And to be able to work with people anywhere in the world was great because I got tired of like, I felt like I couldn't walk in my local grocery store and look like crap because I'm going to run into real estate clients. Right. You know, who knew me? I was like, yeah, forget that. I like the idea of like sitting at home and nobody knowing who I am. Yeah. I think you're oversimplifying though, because it, you know, to hear you talk <laughs> about it, it, it sounds kind of like, well, I went, 
I went to coaching because it was easier and a little bit less work and things like that. And I think we both know that that's not the case. So when you, you talk about like, I, obviously you were good at real estate because you've got the sales and the marketing background and all that. But you say like, I was made for coaching. Why do you say that? Like, what did you realize either about yourself or about the work you were doing that told you like, this is what I was meant to do? Um, I think the fact that, see, I don't know, because I don't think I do anything special, but I do look at things slightly different than most people. And I think that gives me a unique advantage to be able to help people. Also, I've been in my own way almost my entire life and know what it's like to help someone get out of their own way. You, you know, we're, we're often our own biggest enemy. And often what's holding an entrepreneur back is not the market or their product or their offer, but it's self-sabotage and doubt and habits and, you know, those things. And so as I continue to read all those books and study, you know, it just became that thing of, I want to talk about that all the time. And I realized that I had read and studied more than anybody else. And so it was like, wow, because I'm a better student than most, I may be more equipped to help people. Mm. You know, and then going back to kind of that punk rock edge of, I'm also not afraid of anybody. So I will tell any person, here's what you're doing wrong. Here's what you're screwing up. And all of a sudden in coaching, that's applauded. <laughs> right like right. socially at dinner with friends like no no one's gonna like you, <laughs> you know, right but all of a sudden in this business context it's like that brashness you, you know like um people that know me that they've often compared me you know to house from the show you know with the doctor you know <laughs> yeah, like, absolutely right and, and so i was like oh well coaching's a career that embraces that and in fact is like championing it and like yeah dude like we love that because they just want the help they just want truth they just want you know, some kind of, you know, information that's going to help them move a step forward. And that fascinated me. I also have always been very interested in that every entrepreneur has different challenges, mm -hmm. but also they all kind of have the same challenges. And that became like, I like that puzzle, you know, almost like going back to like the Dr. House thing of like, hmm, what is this? I'm really fascinated by, oh, you've got this challenge. Right let's unlock that. Let's figure this out and let's figure out what's going on. Um, and that just excited me deeply and it still does to this day. So I'm super curious because you, you talked about like, you know, specifically with head, real estate and coaching, like they both have problems, there's headaches, right. But, but these are more favorable. So what is it that you get out of coaching that makes those things more tolerable? I mean, what are you receiving from what it is that you do that, that makes this the right path for you? Yeah. So I mean, man, so fascinating how this comes back full circle. So obviously a big part of my youth was a lack of self-love and self-worth and you know, all of that. Um, financially, coaching is awesome and it's very rewarding. But in addition to that, it's the validation, right? It's the, oh, I'm not just helping this client. I may be helping their wife. I may be helping yeah. their kids. I may be like, all of a that, that, that element of it is something I take very seriously. And when I hear a client say, thank you, or you've made a huge impact, or sometimes I get notes from the spouse and they're thanking me, like it makes me cry every time because mm -hmm. I'm like, holy crap. Like I like that validation is something I never had. Right. And it's something that I still so passionately seek. And so that I think is the thing for me of, you know, oh yeah, I could go out and sell, you know, some kind of product, but who's thanking me for it, right? <laughs> right? Like I'm in this for the thank yous, yeah. like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I want to help people. And yes, I want the, you know, the financial, financial part that comes from coaching. Right. But at the end of the day, it's like, and it sounds so cheesy, I know, but it's just the truth of, oh my God, these people love me. Like if I died, they might come to the funeral. That right. is everything to me <laughs> because there were too many years of my life when I wanted out or I thought if I was out, no one would even show up or care, you know, yeah. or even, right. So that's the thing now is it's really about that impact of, Oh, Holy crap. Like I'm, you know, I don't want to say I'm changing lives, but I feel like I'm helping people who are out there changing lives. Sure. So it's like, all right, well then I'm a small part of it. I'm cool with that. And it, it does give you that validation. That's like, man, again, like it's awesome to get paid, but it's more like, Oh wow. Like, I'm actually doing something like I'm making a difference. I'm noticed. I'm seen. I'm visible. 
that validation is something that I really, really crave. And uh, to me, it's always keeps me driven, even to this day of helping people. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I love what you say about impact because I, you know, for two reasons. One, obviously with this millennial generation, it's become more of kind of a hot topic of people. Well, I, I want to do work that matters. I want to make a difference. I want to have an impact. Um, and the downside to that though, is I think a lot of people have trouble being satisfied with their current circumstances because they, they kind of feel like if they're not making an impact that something's wrong. I'm just curious, you know, what would be some of your advice to somebody who maybe is still in that realtor position and wants to be a coach or thinks they will be someday, but isn't there, like, how would you help them put in the time, so to speak, between here and there and just help them sort of come to terms with the fact that it's a process and, and things like that? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, th there's not a day in my career that I don't draw on what I did in real estate mm -hmm. that, you know, as much as uh, looking back, there was a time that I hated it. There was a time that I wished I got into coaching sooner. You know, looking back, I'm like every single day of that business made me what I am today and made me ready for, you know, whatever comes at me. And so there's that thing of like, yes, we want to impact people. You've got to do some things in your life that put you in a position to impact people. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And that means you're probably going to have to fail at some things. You're probably going to struggle with uh, different um, just emotions and you may struggle with depression. You may struggle with addiction. You may struggle with different things like all of that, once you can get healthy, can become a tool to say, now I'm in a position to impact people. You know, the thing about it now, Roy, is like when I have a client who says, uh, who calls me, and uh, this is true, like a client I've got now, when he first called me, he said, my wife filed for divorce, the home is in bankruptcy, and I may be suicidal. And I said, I want you to do every single thing I say for the next 90 days, and we're going to turn this around. Now, he's been a client of mine for six years, still married, saved the house, wow. booming business, six figures a month. You know, that is like the only reason I could help him is because the thoughts he was having of, I don't know that I want to live. Right. Like I've been there. Yeah. So I could get to that place with him. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So it's like, man, if my life had been great and it was impact from day one, I couldn't help that guy today. Right. Because, you know, you, you've got to go through some of that. So I think that's the thing is like, if I'm young, then I'm not looking for tragedy, but what I'm looking for is I'm going to learn everything I can. I'm going to understand that, you know, all forms of improvement follow self-improvement. If I keep working on myself, if I keep improving myself, I'm going to end up learning the things that will allow me to help others and have an impact in some way, shape or form. And that's what's lost uh, kind of in the world today, which is, and not just on the youth, but especially kind of on them, sure. is this thing of, oh my gosh, like if you want to impact people, learn from every different angle you can. You know, so many people now are like, oh, well, I know marketing because, you know, I follow Gary Vaynerchuk. And it's like, okay, right. cool. That's great. But also go study what the Mad Men era was doing. Mm -hmm. Go study the ads that were written in the 1920s. Like go study all of it, go study psychology, go study like, you know, all these different things, because that's what makes you equipped to, you know, help people, right? Like, right. that's how you then bring that impact in. And, and I saw this when I was doing, uh, you know, marketing and branding consulting for people, it was amazing how many companies were like, Oh, well, this is our marketing staff. And those people knew nothing. And it's like, what in the world? Like, yeah, and they would look at me and they'd be like, how do you know all of this? And I'm like, it's books. Have you heard yeah, of right. them? Like, just read them. Like, as many of them as you can, right? like, you know, but people wouldn't do that. And so yeah. now um, I think that's the problem is like, you know, if, there, if I have a strategic advantage over anyone, it's simply that I'm a better student. Like yeah. that, that's it. And, and it's ironic because I wasn't a great student in school and I used to have a hard time reading and retaining the info and all of that. But I just trained myself to push past that and, and yeah. get it. And so now, you know, I read a hundred books a year, not because I'm just a huge book nerd, but because yeah, I'm going to, you know, everyone else isn't. So again, like I'm going to do the opposite. Yeah. I think I read somewhere that after college, the average American reads like 12 books for the rest of their life or something crazy. Like, <laughs> yeah, probably it's bananas. Right. And then, yeah, I, I think to add on to what you were saying, I think a big thing that people miss is um, they want to have the impact, which like you just said, requires to some degree that you go through hard stuff. Mm -hmm. Like in order to really have perspective and value to give people, you kind of got to be where they are. But while, so while most people are saying they want to have an impact, they're also doing everything they can to stay comfortable. Right. 
and that just doesn't breed any kind of character or anything like that. So you got to put yourself out there into situations that are uncomfortable where you might fail. You telling your wife to come work for you. You don't know how it's going to work out. You're just going to do it live and we'll see how this thing plays out. Yeah, man. I, I would say I have lived by like my resistance is my to-do list. Like what am I resisting? Yes. Absolutely. And I make a list of all the things I'm afraid of and resisting. And that goes on my to-do list because that's where growth is going to happen. That's where the real results are going to come in. And, and again, like this is coming from a man who probably seeks comfort more than anyone else I know. Like, mm. I, I, you know, if I could stay in my comfort zone for the rest of my life, oh my God, sign me up. Like I would right. do that in a heartbeat. <laughs> I've just learned that doesn't get me what I want. So instead it's like, okay, what am I resisting? Crap. Then that's what I'm going to go do and mm -hmm. watch what happens. And when you do that, like you're talking about just over time, it keeps putting you in a position to be able to impact people. And it also allows you to continue to impact people. So there's not a ceiling then on right. the level of impact you can have because you continue to go outside that comfort zone. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really become real for me with a lot of my own content because this coaching and, and some of the things I'm talking about now have been on my mind for the better part of 15 years now. Um, but I really don't have a, a better way to say it than that it has just become time for mm -hmm. the content that I have. You know, there was, there was just something inside of me, a certain level of knowledge or experience or something I needed to hit before my own brain would say, yeah, you have something valuable to say. And I just had to reach that point. It, but I only got there because I did a whole lot of stuff the wrong way and, you know, tried a bunch of things and things didn't work. And, you know, here right. we are. So, you know, go, going back to, you know, putting yourself out there and like, you don't know, like you created content and then you got feedback. Right? right. And I think that's the problem is a lot of people now are setting goals and ambition and like never stopping to get some feedback along the way to see, right. like, does anyone want this and does it work? Yeah. And going to that, go after what you're resisting or what's outside your comfort zone. My first time ever speaking in public, uh, I was at a real estate conference as a student and I had been uh, you know, successful already at that point, like in this coaching program that I was in. And on a lunch break, one of the coaches walks by and he comes up to me and he goes, hey, uh, do you wanna to talk to some of our people and help them out, tell your story? And I was like, yeah, dude, I got you. Like, no problem. Brooke and I are sitting there, you know, eating our Subway sandwiches or whatever. And like, sure, man, because I'm thinking, maybe in a hallway, like, right. you know, he's got a couple guys he wants to introduce me to or whatever. So as lunch starts to get over, I go and I find him and he goes, uh, let me take you to what room you're going to be in. And I'm like, Oh, cool. This is a breakout session. Like I'm going to talk to more than five people. This is amazing. Right. And so we're standing in the hall and we're just hanging out and he goes, it'll be just a second. I'm like, all right. And we're just standing there and I'm listening. And all of a sudden I hear like everybody clapping and he goes, okay, you're on. And he opens the door and it's the conference. Oh, wow. And like the lights are on, stage is empty. It's like, you know, here's, and I'm like, oh, like, I don't have anything prepared. I've never done this. Yeah. I got on that stage. The lights are hitting me. The crowd is there. And, and I told my wife, I said, at that moment, they created a monster. Like I became drunk with power. I was like, <laughs> this is where I was made to be. Yeah. But had he come up to me and said, we want you to speak at one of our events. We want to speak in front of everybody, whatever. I would have said, no, I'm not ready for that. Right. There's no, even though I wanted to do it, I would have told him no, because I yeah. was way too afraid. And I would think that I needed to be prepared and all of that. Because I kind of got thrown out to it, I ended yeah. up with a standing ovation. And I was like, oh my God. Like, and I mean, I came up, I remember Brooke was like, you had way too much fun up there. Like she knew at that point, like there would be no <laughs> flying home with me, right? Like it was just, you know, completely ridiculous. But that you know i now get paid to speak at events would that be happening today had i not said yes to something without trying to figure it all out without right. you know making sure that i knew everything i was going to say and it was all polished and you know what about my slide deck or what it's like no like i literally just stood there right. and told them my story that was it <laughs> right and so that's what i'm saying is like if you don't put yourself in those situations time and time again what do you then learn that you can then help someone with, you know, later to have that impact? Yeah, absolutely. No, that's so true. And you're obviously still doing the coaching and the speaking and all that, but I know that your content has kind of shifted again. You still do some of the marketing branding, but you're also doing a lot more mindset coaching. So what did that, you know, yet again, another sort of change in direction, what did that look like and how did yeah. that come about? And, and I'm really interested to hear you talk about 
um, how you made the decision to go that route and, and sort of what were the things that were important to you in thinking about that? So th this is interesting and, and I hope it will help people because I didn't overthink it. At the same time, I had a lot of doubts. <laughs> so this is what happened. If you remember, when I'm a teenager, I'm reading stuff like Think and Grow Rich right. and, and all these books about mindset. Because of my own issues with depression and low self-confidence and all of that, mindset is something I was working on every single day, all the time. I knew it was the thing that kept holding me back. So even though I was having success, mm -hmm. I could see where I could be if I wasn't in my own way. So constant work in progress. Because of that, I found the more I learned from, you know, gosh, you know, with not just Napoleon Hill, but, you know, Wayne Dyer, or Ogmandino, or just, you know, any of like the classic guys I was like, this is like, I just love, it. I could not get enough of it. Right. Well, as I'm coaching people, you quickly start to learn that you can give someone an incredible marketing plan. <laughs> if their mindset is not right. Yeah they will not get the results that they should. They will find a way to screw it up and sabotage right. it. And I got really frustrated with going in and helping these brands and saying, listen, you're not getting the results because you aren't, um, you know, you're like, you're not thinking right. Like you, you gotta get your mind right to then do this. So it was like, well, we'll get to the marketing, but before we do, I've got to fix your mind first. Right. And so I was already like helping with do that. So what ended up happening is I spoke at an event and it was a huge conference. Uh, I'm talking like one of those five day conferences where Microsoft is a sponsor and like, oh, wow. you know, Tide laundry detergent had this like huge 50 foot booth and like, it was insane. Yeah. And I'm there to talk about branding, uh, which, you know, made sense, right? Had the book out and you know, all that stuff. Uh, great lineup of speakers over these days, several of whom were friends of mine and still are, uh, but like really, really quality. And I was like, man, this is cool to be a part of it. I go up there and my room is so packed. People are sitting on the floor on the aisles and in the back. Wow. Like it's crazy. There are people tweeting that they feel sorry for whatever other speakers are going on in another room at the same time as me because they're like, everybody's here. And I'm thinking, I don't know why, like, this is crazy. Yeah. But I get up there and I do my thing. And again, like great talk, standing ovation, the feedback from the audience comes in and I'm voted top speaker of the event. Wow. So the lady who put on the event uh, is a friend of mine, goes to church with me. She and I and Brooke uh, kind of duck away from the rest of the conference, find a little corner hallway in the hotel. And we sit down and she goes, that was fantastic. Why were you miserable? And I'm like, excuse me, like, did you not see? I just, you know, brought down the house. Like this was a, you know, epic, you know, Jerry Lee Lewis kind of, you know, performance here. I might as well, you know, kick the piano off stage or whatever. <laughs> like this was, you know, incredible. And she's like, no, I know you and you were going through the motions. I've seen you talk about other things and you were way more lit up. Hmm. And I was like, interesting. But then she had to go because she's putting on the event. So she's like, I got to go. I'll catch up with you later. So Brooke and I are talking and keep in mind, uh, Brand Against the Machine, my first book had come out. I had a contract with the publisher to write another book. And so that book was going to be about client retention. It was going to be called Till Death Do Us Part. And then the subtitle was How to Create Customers for Life. And I told Brooke at that hotel, I said, and we were in Texas. I was like, listen, we got to get that book out and get that done. Because I want my third book to be helping people with mindset. Like, that's what I want to talk about. That's what I feel like I should talk about. And she was like, I don't know. I feel like you should maybe do it now. And I'm like, no, there's no way I can do it now. Like I'm the branding guy and all that. And she's like, I don't know. Like you need to think about it. So on the flight home, I made a list of what I call my anchors, which was who would support me if I stopped talking about marketing and went all in on mindset. And that list was two people. <laughs> right. So a good friend of mine and my wife, I was like, okay, they'll support it. So I get home and I get on the phone with my clients, you know, one-on-one -on -one throughout the week. And each one I say, same thing. I'm like, listen, you're going to see an adjustment. I'm going to talk less about marketing and more about mindset. And here's why this, I feel this on my heart. Like, you know, all, all went through the whole thing. And Rory, every single client said, isn't that what you already do? <laughs> and I'm like, is it? And they were like, yeah. And then one of them even told me, uh, Jason Elkins, who, you know, he yeah. goes, you know, I don't consider you my marketing coach. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you consider me? And he was like, 
you're my mentor. And I'm like, oh, so now I'm like low confidence of the branding guy didn't know his own brand, right? Like <laughs> now it seems even more confusing. And so again, like to what we were saying a moment ago, advising people like get that feedback. I started creating content about mindset. And the moment I did, there were more shares, more comments, more likes, more website traffic, mm -hmm. you know, like just instantly more, right? And I was like, well, this is obviously a sign that people need it people are craving it and that people may uh, want my opinion on it, <laughs> right? Now, I'm gonna share you like, something again. I don't know why you're getting all this stuff out of me that no one's ever gotten, but here you go. Another story uh, that no, nobody knows unless they're like a super close friend. Um, I had a client who's mega successful. I won't say his name, everybody knows the name. And this dude knows mindset. He's known every guru out there. He in fact was the first coach that Tony Robbins ever hired so like this dude's legit, right? Wow. And uh, he's a client of mine. And of course, because of just how amazing he is, without him realizing it, he's also kind of mentoring me because yeah. I asked him more questions than he asked me, right? Like I'm, you know, right. like, you know, it was a weird thing. And uh, he and I go to dinner. He lived in Nashville at the time. We go to dinner and I'm telling him, I'm like, listen, you know, I talk about the branding and marketing stuff. That's obviously going well. I've started talking about this mindset stuff and I'm thinking that I want to write a book about that, but you tell it like it is and you know this stuff. Tell me why that's a bad idea that, that we don't need another person talking about this. There's already, you know, the greats who have done it. Yeah. And he puts his fork down and he goes, John, if you died, do you want your kids, Jack and Ava, to have a book about keeping clients? or a book about getting their mindset right that's gonna help them in all areas of their life forever. And I, I started tearing up, because you know, he played the kid card, right? Which is really yeah, unfair. Right, absolutely, and I'm like, strings. Yeah, you know, it's like to, to your thing of, you know, legacy, it's like, he's basically asking me, what do you want your legacy to be? Right. <laughs> right? You wanna be, you know, the sales guy, or you wanna be, you know, this? And I said, oh my gosh, I said, obviously I want the other, I said, but don't you think that like that space is too crowded and we don't need another person? And he said, John, he goes, that area is so cheesy. They need someone to come in, punch them in the face, tell them the truth, tell them like it is. And, and you have that gift. You need to do that. And he was the guy that I knew for sure was going to talk me out of it. Yeah. So now I'm driving home and I'm like, holy crap. Now I got to go all in and do that. And so yeah. that's what I've been doing now for a few years is, you know, I still, of course, will talk about marketing and branding, you know, when it makes sense or when someone needs that help. But that was like, you know, kind of to this overall theme of seeking validation a little bit. Mm -hmm. It was, how did the audience react when I started writing about this, when I started right. talking about it? Oh, cool. They're responding. How did my clients react? They responded well. How did a trusted uh, you know, advisor re react to me? Oh, like he's encouraging me. You know, all the signs were there of, okay, go do this. Now, I could have just went and done it, but to the point of what we're saying, it's like, I did it. I started creating the content. I started asking around and I was measuring the feedback I got, you know, to see, is this a good idea or not? You know, what do people actually want? So I know that was a long answer to that question, but that's that transition of how uh, I kind of went from the marketing and branding guy to what I am now. And I, I love so much that he asked you that question because if there is one introspective question that I think everybody benefits from asking themselves, it's what do you want your impact or your legacy to look like after you die? Mm -hmm. That question is so clarifying because it strips away all the stuff that we fall victim to with like, like you being in your, you're like, I'm in my branding prime right now. I cannot right. change courses. It's like, okay, well fast forward 50 years. What do you want that to look like? And it's like, Oh, completely different perspective when you zoom out. Right. And I think that's so, that's just one thing I don't, I don't think enough people do or constantly, you know, going back to being on the path that's set before you, we're thinking, okay, four years of high school, then I got four years of college, then I do this job for a few, then I, it's like we're, our, our time frame is so short that we never really get that perspective of, you know, the ultimate one of like, well, after you're gone, what do you want this to look like? Um, it's just awesome to hear how valuable that was for you. I know that a similar exercise has been super valuable for me in figuring out what my purpose is. So, um, yeah, you know, when I compare this, what I'm doing today, to like say going back to real estate and talking about what you're saying and, and how that affects the legacy. You know, I saw what the next 20 years of real estate was going to look like. And it was fine, but that wasn't the legacy I wanted. 
Right. When I look at myself now in my career now and where I want to be in the next 20 years, you know, I, I want to leave the world dozens of books that, that I've written, you know, about this. I want to leave, you know, tens of thousands of hours of content and, you know, like not just because my children or whatever, like, but that's, that's it. Like now all of a sudden I go from, you know, there's financial goals, but now there's like, oh, you know, when I die, this is what I want people to say. This is yeah. how I want them to talk about me. This is how I would like to be remembered, like maybe longer than, you know, six days after the actual death. Yeah, you know? right. Sadly, you know, a lot of people pass away and it's, you know, sad in the moment. And right. a year later, you know, who's thinking about them? Who's talking about them? Like maybe their family, but, you know, wh wh who else, right? Like, you know, there are people that have passed away that I still listen to their old podcast. I still read their books. And, and every day I'm like, man, if they were here, that would be amazing. And it's like, that's the legacy I want. Yeah. Right. Right. Like that's the thing, you know, whether I've got a year left or, you know, 40 years left, it, like I, you know, I just want that. I want to leave work behind me, like something that's going to, you know, help people and, you know, be as timeless as possible. So again, like going back, it's like, okay, I could see what the future of real estate looked like. I can see what the future of this looks like, mm -hmm. which one gives me the legacy that I want, you know, and yeah. that's, that's what helps fuel the decisions today is, you know, I'm very much aware that that legacy is being made right now. <laughs> and so, you know, the clock's ticking, I got to make it, you know, happen and, you know, get that legacy created. Yeah, I'm so glad you actually answered a question I had that we hadn't gotten to yet, but it's, you know, kind of around how do you, you know, with where you are now, how do you cast a vision for yourself from, from today into the future? And, and you just said, you know, by looking at your legacy and, and making decisions based on that, I think that's so powerful. I'd love to hear you talk just real briefly. I know we're, we're coming up on time, but um, it, it's, it's <laughs> what I know people will do is they'll listen to all the stories that you've told and they'll focus on all the things you've done well and they'll sort of gloss over the times where you struggled or failed. Like <laughs> right, right. you have a bias for that. So I, I'd love to hear you just talk a little bit about, um, you know, a challenge or, or challenges you're facing now and sort of how you're dealing with them in, in real time to, you know, continue to grow through them and, and still be successful in spite of things that are, are hard. Yeah. I think it's really important to let people know that despite what I've achieved to this day, like to even today, right. my biggest struggle is still, am I good enough? Am I worthy? You know, kind of a thing. Like I have clients all the time, like, okay, let's do uh, real time. Cause I know everyone wants to do, uh, you know, their fake stories and their fake, you know, scarcity. Uh, I get a client from a gentleman. I don't know if you can even see that. Probably can't, but uh, named John Nemo, you know, who says uh, watching a replay of today's group coaching call, it is criminal. You are not sharing your talents with a larger audience. You're such a good speaker and presenter. Get with it. Now, I get a message like this from John pretty often, but yeah. that's today. That's current today. Now, I love that, right? But John's right. I should put my content out there more. I should put myself out there more. There's still that fear of, am I good enough? Am I worth it? Am I worthy? You know, and even though my client track record is super strong, what clients say about me is super humbling and amazing. I'm still full of that self doubt. I'm still that teenager. That's like, well, who cares about me? Right. You know? And so I think it's important for people to know that at every single level, this is the thing that I found, you know, I, I've met people that are bringing home $700 million a year after taxes and expenses and everything. And they're still struggling with confidence, just like anybody else. Yeah. Now that's crazy to me because like, dude, if you could just give me half that, <laughs> all my confidence issues are gone, right? Like, just yeah. give me that. I will find out if money can buy happiness. Like, let me try that for a while. But it's that, you know, even at that level, everybody still wants to be seen. Everyone wants to feel significant. Everyone, you know, wants to be validated. And that's the thing. So like, you know, still to this day, I am what is holding me back. Not opportunity, not um, technology, not uh, tools or market or anything. It's still at the end of the day, it's still me. It's still that fear of, Oh gosh, you know, if I put myself out there like that, uh, you know, what if it doesn't work? What if no one cares? What if it, you know, whatever, right? Like it, it, that's still that battle and I know better, but it's still, it's like every day, that's what I'm working on. Yeah. So, you know, that's the dark side of it, right? Is that, you know, you have this blessing and curse of knowledge where you know what to do 
but then you start to know yourself so well, you know, like, oh, geez, I know exactly where I'm screwing up. You know, I remember one day calling my wife and I'm like, I got good news and bad news. And she was like, all right. She was like, what's the good news? And I was like, the good news is I figured out the source of all of our problems. And she was like, okay, so what's the bad news? I was like, the bad news is it's me. (laughs) I'm it. Like I'm it. There's no, as much as I would love to blame someone or something else. Right. No, it is all me. And, And so again, you know, the struggle is I can look at where I'm at and say, Oh, cool. John's had some success where I know my potential is. I'm actually a failure. Sure. So I'm waking up every day with that sense of I'm behind and I'm failing and I got to bridge that gap between where I am and where my potential is. That's the motivation. And it's something that I've been working on uh, really hard, even like in recent times, because I know every time I break through to a new level of that, the results are tremendous. So that's what it's about is kind of uh, constantly working on that. And that's why I tell people, you know, when I said earlier that self-improvement is what creates improvement in all areas of your life. Like if you want your marriage to be better, Mm -hmm. work on yourself. If you want your kids to be better, like work on yourself. Like you want your income to be better, work on yourself. It, It doesn't live in a silo. It will affect every single area of your life. The problem is most people don't want to work on themselves or the ones that do stop. Yeah. And that's the thing I've learned. It's like, this game doesn't end when I'm 77 years old, I'm still going to be reading self-help books <laughs> because I know I'm still going to need to improve. I'm still going to need, you know, to have that benefit. So that's one of the things that challenges me a lot. And then I'll also share another one, um, which is, you know, I talked about before, you know, I saw the path for real estate and then it got boring. Um, same thing happened by the way, with rock music. Like we had people showing up and they're like, these guys are good. Let's talk to them. And once I saw, Oh, I could actually do this and we could go on tour. I I wasn't as interested. (laughs) Right. Like it's like, once I know I can do something, all of a sudden the excitement just goes away. Right. That's a challenge. So what I have to do today is constantly figure out how to motivate myself and how to keep that drive going. Because, uh, you know, there's a lot of times as the pathway clears up for you, the excitement isn't there, you know, especially being an entrepreneur, part of what you love in the beginning is the scrappiness of it. Right. A lot of people, they love their back against the wall. They love it so much that when their back's not against the wall, they'll ruin everything to get back in that position Absolutely. to try to, you know, rebuild again. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, I met a gentleman one time and uh, we were uh, having dinner at a, at a conference and he was like, I have been a multimillionaire three different times, <laughs> lost it all and had to build back. And I said, man, you love having your back against the wall, don't you? And he was like, dude, he's like, that's it. He was like, I love it. I feel so alive. I'm like, you got to find another way to be alive. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> right? Skydiving, man. <laughs> when you got things going on. Uh, but that's, so those are just some of the things that I still, you know, struggle with. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. So I have one more question for you. I'm going to save it to after that. I just want to give you an opportunity to tell the audience where they can find you, how you want them to connect with you. If there's anything you're working on that you want them to check out, uh, any of that. So they can find me at johnmichaelmorgan.com. That's, you know, the simple, easiest place. Uh, it'll tell you more about me than you'd ever want to know. Actually, this, this podcast will tell people more about me <laughs> than they would ever want to know. But certainly there, uh, I do have my own podcast coming out soon, new books, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, if they go to johnmichaelmorgan.com, you can then figure out which social networks I'm on and all that stuff. That's awesome. Last question, John. What does legacy mean to you? We've tiptoed around it a little bit. I was I should have been prepared to give you some kind of epic answer. Um, here's what it means to me. A couple of years ago, a pastor of mine died, uh, had a very rare form of cancer. And the impact he had where to this day, everyone who knew him continues to talk about how they miss him. That, you know, they wish he was alive. Like, oh, if we could just hear him right now. And how many times he randomly pops up in my mind. And I didn't know him super well, right? Mm -hmm. But like just how many times, you know, I'm driving down the road or whatever. And just for some reason, a picture of him or his name or something just flashes through my thought. I want that. Like, I want all of you suckers to be stuck thinking about me (laughs) for years after I'm gone, right? Like that, that's it. Because I get like, so I come from a big family on both sides. We've lost a lot of family members to old age and everything, you know, from the time I've been a kid all the way up to now. And it's not that those people don't have a legacy, but like I said, you know, not all those people 
am I randomly thinking of? Yeah. You know, and so I just want to help people to the point that, you know, when I'm gone, my name still comes up and, you know, positively. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> right? like, <laughs> so that, that's it. I think it's just simply, uh, you know, being, being remembered. And I think the only way to do that, of course, is it's not about uh, business achievements or, or anything like that. It's more, how did I make people feel? How did I help them? Uh, you know, how did I impact them? Same thing with my family. Uh, so I, I don't know, man, I, I wish I had like an epic answer for you, but I guess I'm just going to say just for people to still remember who I freaking was years from now and not be like, John Morgan, is that that attorney? Like, that's my nightmare, right? <laughs> is that they're going to be like, John Morgan, I don't remember him, but I remember that crazy attorney who had all the, you know, free weed commercials or whatever it is that guy ever does. <laughs> That's awesome, John. Well, I really appreciate you coming on. I'm so thankful for your time and uh, hopefully we can do another one again soon. Absolutely, man. Thank you. All right. Take care, John. Mm -hmm.